2019. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker. And his name is Harry Halpin. He's the founder of NIM and the project coordinator of the Next Leap. And he's talking about fighting back, back against Libra, decentralizing Facebook Connect, NIM anonymous authentication credentials. And I'm happy he's here. Please give a big applause for Harry Halpin. Uh, okay. So it's always good to be back at Chaos Computer Camp. A few years ago, when I uh, first came to Chaos Computer Congress, I was working on JavaScript cryptography, was really thrilled at the community here, came back for camp where I talked about my own rather personal experiences uh, in terms of surveillance. And over the last few years, uh, what I've been up to with a lot of other people who will congratulate the end and who really have done a huge amount of work is we've been trying to build something which I think Chaos Computer Congress inspired me to, to work on, decentralized uh, privacy enhancing technologies. And in particular, we're going to look at the case of Facebook as a whole, but in particular what we believe is the most dangerous part of not only Facebook but all of the centralization inside of Silicon Valley, which is their identity systems, in particular Facebook Connect. And then we're going to see how privacy enhanced decentralized alternatives work. So fighting against back against Libra. And I think you know the issue with Libra, uh, originally called Global Coin, is incredibly politically and philosophically interesting. It saw it signals that the nation-state order that arised in Germany at uh, the Treaty of Westphalia is collapsing and that now private companies are now taking over parts of infrastructure and parts of services that were traditionally provided by governments. Currency is obviously one case and identity is another, and they're intimately connected. And Global Coin shows that the ambition of Mark Zuckerberg and the ambition of, I think, any of these companies is to build a global system of identity, which is a necessity for a global system of currency. And that, I believe, is extremely dangerous, dangerous insofar as if it is ran in an authoritarian manner, and all for-profit companies are ran in an authoritarian manner, this is actually considerably worse than nation-state identity and incredibly dangerous in compared to, for example, you know, decentralized key-based identity or federated email-based identity. So Libra is announced as a global cryptocurrency, it actually makes uh, quite a lot of sense as a design of a technical perspective. I'm not going to go too far into it. I think Morgan Beller, the designer, is somewhere here at camp, so you can talk to her about it. But effectively, it is a blockchain. There are validators. There are blocks. Transactions are collected and written to blocks. On that level, uh, not actually particularly interesting. It uses a fast consensus algorithm, which has the rather hilarious name Hot Crap and uh, is essentially the validators confirm transactions. And this is where it gets interesting. Because the validators are the exact same companies and to some extent investors and startups that really power surveillance capitalism. So it's not just Facebook. Although Facebook has built the technology and initiated the effort, they've created what's called a Swiss Verein, which is a equivalent to a mutual association. And in this mutual association, um, there are different companies, including some traditional blockchain companies, such as Coinbase, large investment firms, Anderson Horowitz, uh, but also startups, Uber, Lyft, and both huge Silicon Valley companies such as eBay, telco providers such as Vodafone, and the current sort of payment providers, MasterCard, Visa, PayPal. 
I mean, this is an incredibly powerful group of companies. And the primary design bet of the Facebook Libra Association is that each of these companies has paid $10 million up front to be a validator for these transactions. So that you know, even though the blockchain itself will be public, there will be an API against it. Uh, you'll probably be able to write apps against it. And it, it is interesting, I think, very, to some extent, cypherpunk to try to put open source in the middle of such a titanically uh, huge company, which really controls like the identity of a third of sentient life in terms of humanity. Uh, nonetheless, these are the companies that we're trusting to validate the transactions. So on that level, it's not exactly decentralized. But that's not the real problem. There's been lots of complaints. Is it the blockchain system? Is it the real blockchain system? Is it decentralized? The real problem, and the, from an economic perspective, which I think we should actually congratulate Facebook on, is that they're saying it's completely absurd that the US government is the reserve currency of the world. I mean, come on, Trump's in power. They're doing a trade war with China. They're printing tons of money to sustain unsustainable American consumer debt. So they took a basket of uncorrelated assets, yen, dollars, Swiss franc, combined them with percentages, and they've created a new currency. And this actually does threaten the US dollar as a reserve currency. And that's where the action's been. You can see the US Congress is called uh, the kind of media head and the director of uh, Libra inside of Facebook to testify at Congress. But I think, weirdly enough, I mean, probably Facebook screwed it up. Probably the regulators will not allow private companies to create a new global payment and transaction system based on essentially a basket of currencies which will disrupt the dollar. And, you know, I, I, I would be dubious if the kind of six billion that got put in the Libra Association Swiss bank account, the US government can't poke through and get all the way to the 60 billion or however much it is inside of Facebook's bank account. Nonetheless, if it does happen, and we already know these things will eventually work, even if Facebook doesn't do it, you know, people will have phone numbers and be able to send payments in, in their phones, and this will lead to tons of payment. And, and the vision that Facebook is pushing with the Libra World is that this will allow us to bank the unbanked. This will allow us that the, you know, the large portion of humanity in countries like India, Sub-Saharan Africa that do not have access to bank accounts. As an American in Europe, it's actually really hard to get a European bank account. This will allow people to have bank accounts. However, what even though Facebook has said, we will not use your personal data in the Libra Association. We will not share your personal data with, say, PayPal or whoever, the people running the validators. There is this giant loophole, and that is that the wallet, the Calibra wallet, will have to do what's called KYC AML, know your customer, anti-money laundering. They will essentially have to identify every person using the Calibra wallet. And they will be able to, as they have stated in their response to the regulators, they will be able to leverage the tremendous amount of personal data that they control, at least they easily can, in order to take these pseudonymous keys, which are on the Libra blockchain, which has validators, which is replicable, and et cetera, et cetera. And they will be able to attach identities to those keys. And how they do that is a software which no one has talked about, which is the most important part of Facebook's current empire. And to be honest, I believe Calibra and Libra are just another way to leverage this kind of technology to create even more personal data. Because right now, Facebook obviously has your friends and your name and all of that, but they really would like your bank account. And this is done via what's called Facebook Connect. Everyone who uses the app typically signs in with Facebook Connect. And there are probably 
as many Facebook Connect, or on the same magnitude at least, Facebook Connect transactions as there are Visa transactions. This is the identity system of the internet currently for the vast majority of users, whether we like it or not. And it, as hackers, as programmers, as people who want to change the system, we should understand this incredibly vital technology and build alternatives. So the technology is built on a very innocent standard called IETF uh, OAuth, which uh, stands for Web Authorization. And what OAuth is, it was invented, a good friend of mine, uh, another great anarchist program called Blaine Cook was working at Twitter, and at the time, in 2003, 4, 5, it, you know, people wanted to sign on to Twitter, but they wanted some, you know, profile data from them, a photo, easy access, not having to repeat passwords. So, you know, at the time, they said, well, just give us your Gmail password, and we'll give you access to Twitter. But that's very dangerous, because then Twitter has access to your entire Gmail. So OAuth was invented not as a mass personal data collection scheme, but as a way to essentially help people log in for a single sign-in login, and then authorize the transfer of data. And the transfer of data takes place through the following players, the identity provider, the, who is, for example, Facebook, who has a lot of your personal data, and you would like to hand that data to a service provider, also called a relying party, that needs this personal data. And you have the user who gave the personal data to the identity provider to begin with and needs to authorize the service prov provider. So they've already authenticated using a password, two-factor authentication, whatever, to the identity provider. They've approached a new service, for example, say Twitter, and they want to use their Facebook ID to log into Twitter. And so you want to transfer data without sharing any authentication credentials. You might want to transfer all sorts of data, cities, age, whatever. You want to authorize that. And how OAuth does is very simple, because at the time, JavaScript cryptography and web cryptography in general was very immature. So they couldn't use digital signatures. People couldn't interoperate on, with digital signatures. Instead, all security boils down to TLS. This is the kind of flow. I'm just going to step through the flow really quickly. But you've all done this a million times, so you kind of know how it works. In the first step, you go up to Twitter, and you say, hi, I would like to use my Twitter account. Twitter says, do you want to log in with Facebook? You click that log in with Facebook button, and you are effectively shipped over to the IDP, which in this case would be Facebook. Now you're on, you got shipped. That's step two. Step three, you say, yeah. Facebook says, do you want to authorize Twitter to have my data? You click yes. That's step three. You move, you, when you click step four, you go back to Twitter. Twitter, you have a token, which is called a bearer token. That token is basically a time-stamped kind of hash is one way to think about it, essentially a capability if you're into sort of that kind of way of thinking about things. You hand that token, which functions as a capability, to Twitter. Twitter then shows that to Facebook in step six. And in step seven, all that precious personal data flows from Facebook to Twitter. And what's really dangerous is that you will have to do that when you use Calibra, when you use a wallet which is compliant, and they'll use the, re regulation, the compliance regulations as the kind of excuse, there are privacy ways to be compliant. But of course, I would be highly dubious that people would not leverage them out of public data they can, that they already have to, to, to use here, that they will be able to control your financial data and send that data back and forth using this kind of centralized identity scheme they've already set up with Facebook Connect to both verify who you are and what you're purchasing. Because in the current scheme, as you may have noticed, the identity provider, which is Facebook in this case, has 100% transparency into which services you're using and when you're using them. And with Calibra, they would have 100% transparency into what purchases you're making and who you're making them with and when you're making them. And that, of course, is a tremendous amount of very valuable data currently spread in a heterogeneous manner among various banks. It seems to be a great business ploy to push that all together inside of Facebook. And you know, we have to do something here, I, I think, to prevent what will be effectively a totalitarian identity system on a scale that we have never seen before. 
It will destroy, uh, people may get, think however they want about the blockchain space, but essentially attaching Facebook identities via Facebook Connect to pseudonymous keys will kill innovation in the blockchain space. It will divide the blockchain into essentially a mass market identified blockchain. And it will be, to be honest, total nonsense in terms of the people they're trying to serve. Obviously, people who are in countries such as, you know, which don't, uh, India, China, may not have all their identity papers, may not be able to pass normal banking compliance, will also not be able to pass very easily banking compliance for the Calibra wallet, and maybe Facebook can help do that via leveraging all this data, but it still seems to be a very flimsy excuse to engage in this truly tremendous amount of data collection. So what we want is we want an alternative. And luckily, cypherpunks have been working on this along with academic cryptographers for more than 20 years. So the, the, the quote I like to repeat is that privacy is the power to selectively reveal oneself to the world, which means under your control when you want it and with whatever data you believe is sufficient for the operations of whatever service you choose to use. And that really is freedom. Otherwise, you will be tracked and be, services can be censored. And it's exceedingly dangerous. Sorry. So these are the sort of two fundamental problems we have to tackle. One is how do we create, how do we not create the kinds of activities that people want to do, logging into things, paying for things, without a centralized identity provider like Facebook in the middle. And I hope some, we'll talk about this briefly, but there was a great talk about yesterday by David Stanton. Even with that, massive, powerful adversary, say it's just the NSA can just kind of watch the traffic and use that to violate privacy. So we do need some traffic, TCPI, UDP level protection as well. So the centralized entity providers, just to repeat, they throw kind of attacks they can use on date on ordinary people, they capture identity data, they know exactly which services a user uses, when they use them, they can transfer personal data, ideally with consent, but they don't have to ask for consent technically, and they can even impersonate you to other service providers, and they can censor service providers. They can prevent people from logging in to service providers they may not agree with. Luckily, there is technology, and this is the main technology I'm going to explain. It was created by an obscure London startup. I recommend looking at the Wired article called uh, Chain Space that came out of University College London and was acquired by Facebook. But luckily for us, that software was left open source and the papers are all published in the, without patents and all that stuff. And it's, it's very ironic this happened because the researchers that were working on this were funded by you know, the European Commission mostly to create privacy enhanced decentralized technologies in cities such as Barcelona and Amsterdam to enable citizens to own their own data. So that's kind of the background of where this technology came from and the particulars technology, some of it also came from another project called NextLeap which I coordinated which essentially was trying to say after the Snowden revelations, how can we build better decentralized privacy enhanced identity systems? So this is going to be a quick overview. I'm just going to give the intuitions behind the cryptography, but I think you'll probably get, a, get, get something from it. The solutions on a very broad scale is in order to end metadata collection, as mentioned earlier, you need something like Tor or ideally something even better, such as a mixnet. We're going to focus on authentication. You want privacy enhanced transfer of any data under absolute user control. That's why we're going to use anonymous authentication credentials. And you want tokens which can basically subsidize the whole system. Make sure that's sustainable and people can do transfer in a privacy way, privacy enhanced manner. And we also want a few other properties. We want possibly these transfers of data to be cryptographically unlinkable actually anonymize. We want users to be able to not only show data, such as I am 18, but also private attributes, proof that they know something without revealing it, such as proof that I own a secret, or proof that I'm a member of a, country, uh, a citizen in Europe without revealing which country. And we also may want you know, a lot of anonymous technologies, makes it very hard to produce some very useful applications, such as, for example, long-term 
uh, messaging. We want a profile which can receive and send messages over long periods of time. So we want pseudonym in integration, not just complete anonymity. So anonymous authentication credentials have been around for a very long time. The initial work was, of course, done by David Chom, who's one of the you know, fathers of the modern cypherpunk movement and, and most of the interesting work we see in cryptography, including mixnets that we're now finally getting to market. And it, but what they do is a very simple blinded signature scheme where you basically have some credentials, you verify that these credentials are true, these attributes such as age, name, citizenship, and the blinding basically prevents the issuer to kind of know exactly what the credentials are. They can just show that they're, uh, they have been issued correctly that they are indeed correct, and that other service providers can verify them. But the problem is every time you reshow that credential, you allow yourself to be linked. Again, you know, blind signatures, you see the same, even if you see the same ciphertext more than once, you can look at the byte pattern and the ciphertext and link it. So luckily there's been some um, really amazing work that's been a, a more research papers I can possibly go into, primarily by Jan Kamenisch, and many other people talking about blinded showing, which allows multiple shows of the same credential. And that's really, I think, uh, a wonderful work, but it's very complicated. And we're going to talk about some new work that uses algebraic max, which is, we think, much more efficient, but not decentralized. And then we're going to discuss how we can make it decentralized. OK, so the big picture is you have the user wants to prove that they have some attributes. They get a certified credential from what we call the issuer. So this is sort of a standard, what we would call Sigma protocol game, if you're familiar with cryptography. You show these assertions to a verifier, could be the third party service provider, such as Twitter. And then the verifier can, for example, like check that these are correct. And the general intuition is that uh, the ver unlike when I go to, for example, a bar in the United States, or I go to vote, I show you my ID card, but you know, all you really want to know is the age. You Instead, you get my name and my date of birth and my, where I was born. We allow you just to show just the age, and they learn nothing else. So we can use Max, which are essentially a symmetric crypto cryptographic uh, authentication mechanism which can guarantee integrity and authentication and symmetric crypto to, to sort of sh make this work in a privacy enhanced fashion, but we need a little bit extra. So we want to be able to effectively, we have an issuer and they want to be able to verify these credentials are indeed correct, that they've issued them correctly. There's the user, the prover, they get the certified credential, we've seen this before, and they can make some assertions, which can be proven. But we essentially, there's a secret MAC key, which is then used to essentially MAC the credential. And we use a new cryptographic formulation, which we'll discuss right now, called algebraic MACs to basically make it private. Because if you just use a normal MAC, it's a normal signature. And you can sort of, you don't have any privacy over the credential itself. Algebraic max allow a number of, basically, the way to think about it is it's a normal Mac, but you can basically make them unlinkable. And they're very efficient, just like Macs typically are very efficient. So you have efficient proofs of Mac creation and efficient proofs of possession. And you use the possession of the Mac as showing an attribute. And the issuer basically uses Max as the sort of signature over the attribute. And you can do these protocols in the clear for parameters and key generation. If you want the whole paper, it's uh, Sarah Mickeljohn and Melissa Chase, algebraic max and keyed, ver keyed verification anonymous credentials. And what we did is we took algebraic max and we said, let's make a privacy enhanced version of Facebook Connect. And we made a system called unlimited ID, which embeds the attributes into the Mac messages but we want not only, the, again, we don't want people to be able to say, yes, you know, my name is, my age is, but we also want private attributes, possession of keys. For example, possession of keys which could access 
a bank account, which could access a financial transaction. And so we take this construction, embed it in the previous setup we saw, and then using the issuing authority, you just kind of run it like you would run it with a normal Mac-based credential. So you, you, know, you, you ask your prover, yeah, make sure you sign off the fact that I'm of age X, that I'm a European citizen, whatever. You get that credential. The algebraic Mac can sort of, with over non-zero zero knowledge, non-interactive zero knowledge proofs, can hide the private attributes. The Mac prevents you from just forging it, from just making it up, so some third party has signed off on it. But you could use an anonymous channel to basically have these algebraic Macs verified. And that's kind of one way to create a centralized version of OAuth, which has privacy. That's the unlimited ID technique. And you can do all sorts of great things. You can rate limit. You can check for duplication. And a lot of these things you can do is by simply embedding various hashes, strings, proof of knowledge of strings and keys into the credential itself. And so, for example, this prevents reuse. So you can sort of say, hey, I can't just keep showing you the credential multiple times. I can only show it to you once, which sounds sort of silly, but it actually could be very useful if that credential was, for example, sending money. Because then you don't want to, you want to say, hey, yes, I got a bank account. This bank account has, let's say, 30 euros in it. And then I send the anonymous credential to a verifier, and I ship them the money. They don't know. No one who's watching can figure it out. Your bank has verified that you have 30 euros in your account. That 30 euros then transfers to the service provider. But the service provider can then check with the bank to make sure that 30 euros is still there. But you can still maintain your privacy. So there's very good, neat tricks with Algebraic Max, which unfortunately I do not have time to go into. But we're interested not just in a privacy-enhanced alternative, to Facebook Connect, but a decentralized and privacy enhanced a version of Facebook Connect. So we want something that's a little bit more complicated. We want to have, we don't want to have trust in a single third party, even if they don't know anything about us, to be able to hold, all, hold our keys. So we have a issuing authority, multiple, so you see multiple sort of uh, bobs, multiple bananas, as is in the screen. We get a threshold signature with multiple signing keys, and then we kind of get that credential, we merge the credential, and then we can show that credential to third parties, service providers. So I'm going to show a little bit of code about how that works. So we have this code for this, and I'm going to explain it on GitHub. But let me just show you a little video while we have a second. So this is what's called a uh, NIM wallet. You can embed even currency, which we call NIMS, into this wallet. And then you basically, this is why this step takes a while, you can ask different validators to validate that you have that money in your wallet. So this is like three of five validators, or 60 of 100, or we even get kind of pretty good performance when you have up to 10,000 validators. When that validator confirms that transaction, so it confirms it on a, essentially a blockchain. You, get, you can type in how, many, how much you want. You get that in a credential. You can embed other stuff, such as name and age or whatever else you want. And then you send it. And this is the real trick. You make it privacy enhanced by unlinking it. So you can see there's a re-randomize button. You can click on that button, and the ciphertext itself re-randomizes by simply taking the existing ciphertext and taking it to another exponent. And boom, you've just created an unlinkable, decentralized, privacy-enhanced transaction. And you can send the money to whatever service provider you want. So they go back to the slides. So the codes, AGPL, free software online. We'd love to have people play with it. But just to give you intuition for the tricks that we use, it's very similar to algebraic case, but there's a few different things going on. And you should read the coconut paper. Talk to Mustafa al Basam if he's here, uh, if you can see him around in the audience. 
you embed the attribute that says commitments, sort of standard Peterson style commits. Like I said earlier, you could use non reactive zero knowledge proofs if you want private attributes. And then you have pairing based elliptic curve cryptography, which helps allow the signature itself to be re randomized. So you package up your commits into an encrypted package using Elgamal encryption because you can then re randomize it, ship it up to validators. They validate it. Let's say three of five validate it. You ship it back, and you have some new functions. So while you can get partial credentials from an issuer, a validator, so to speak, the user merges these credentials together. They don't have the, any third party do it for them. And that creates a full credential that embeds all the information for identity they need, which can be shipped to a verifier and a service. And as I showed in the demo, they can then, the user is under control re randomization. So anytime they want to unlink a transaction, they want no one to connect their validation and their issuing, uh, they just basically hit the re randomization button, simple explanation, and they can re randomize the signature itself. And the two other tricks, the tricks, well known tricks, which essentially allow this to work, is you use threshold cryptography to achieve decentralization. And in order to achieve verifiability, because you have to, the people who get these credentials, they have to verify that they're really, the, they're really valid, that they actually, you know, you, someone actually saw something that said you're 18, or you actually do have this amount of money in your bank account. You can basically use the, a hashing trick over the secrets, similar to identity based encryption, to make a hash, which in, anyone can check, which can be publicly published. So we built this whole giant system, which I actually just demoed to you minus the mixnet component already, taking essentially some sort of NIM, some sort of token, shipping it around, embedding all sorts of attributes into anonymous authentication provider pro, uh, credential. You, take, you can have third parties sign off of them. You can create these attributes yourself and make them self-sovereign, so you can sign them, ship them up through from to a validator. The validator doesn't know what credentials you're, you're getting signed off on. They don't know where you're going with them. They just said, yep. Looks valid. Someone signed that. I don't really care. We trust the user here. They ship it back. Depends on the kind of attribute you want. You can then ship it through something like a Mixnet or a Tor, an anonymous communication channel, bring the linkability on the timing aspects and various other metadata. The source provider can then check the credential, go back to the blockchain, make sure that there's been no double spending, and then you can both do one-time attribute shows for essentially financial transactions or other kinds of one-time sort of things, and also multi-shows for things like age, date, whatever, uh, your name, where you, where you really want to tell multiple people, and you can just do it an unlimited amount of time. And you know, because we're not using full ZK snarks, we're using these kind of very specialized non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs, we get pretty linear scaling. Things operate on linkability, can take place in two milliseconds, and verification you know, tends to be around 50. Uh, it's a bit more expensive a procedure because you have to check all the secrets. And you can see the more and more people you add to the system, it of course gets slower because there's more and more things to check, but it's, it's slower in a linear fashion. So we think that's pretty cool. Um, and I think we won't really go into this, but we're really thinking really hard about rewards and how that works, how we can actually make sure that to make Privacy enhances services really sustain, uh, sustainable. Surveillance capitalism is obviously not sustainable, and neither are US government grants to Tor and other projects. We really need to be able for privacy enhancing technologies to be able to plug into something that looks like Facebook Connect, that's decentralized, that defends user privacy, and then lets them get paid in a way where they don't have to essentially hold user data. For example, if, I'm whole, if I run a VPN service, I don't want to have anyone's credit card information. I don't want any more personal data, ideally zero. I just want to provide a VPN service and get paid at the end of the month and know there's real users coming through. And there's tons of other use cases outside of VPNs, one which I think and, you know, the European Commission worked on attribute-based credentials and funded a lot of this for identity management to make an alternative to Facebook Connect. Uh, but there's also, I think, there's a, a very powerful use case around secure messaging. You know, when you use, for example, Signal, you have a phone number, you have contacts, all of this stuff should be embeddable within a privacy-enhanced credential. 
And we're, we have some software. I recommend taking a look at Status, which actually is decentralized, which tries to provide some of the same capability as Signal. And this software should be embeddable. And some of the newer standards coming out to try to make open standards that have better scalability than the Signal protocol in terms of large group messaging and to be an actual IETF open standard. And these kind of standards, because they're built to support things like Facebook Connect as the fundamental identity system, we want to make sure we can slot in sort of decentralized privacy enhancing credentials into uh, these kinds of next generation messaging protocols. So I'd recommend anyone interested in messaging, check out the IETF message layer security work. Um, I won't go into mixed nets because we're running out of time, but again, there was a great talk on yesterday. Just check that talk out. Essentially, it is possible to obfuscate metadata and hook that to a credential. This is all the wonderful people who've been working on the, on the project. Claudia Diaz, Anya, Dave, who actually left Libra and uh, has now joined us. Jared, Andrew, who's done a lot of the hard work on the code. And I would really recommend, you know, if you want to get involved, everything's on GitHub. I want to review some of the papers that you may want to take a look at if you're interested in deep diving. So again, the keywords are chain space. A lot of the code is on their website, lots of good links. Even though they were purchased by Facebook, they're still website and the code's still there. Uh, for early work on anonymous authentication credentials, the really classic paper that goes over Schnorr signatures all the way from 1991, efficient signature generation by smart cards, and then the kind of use of this and what well, ended up being Microsoft Passport by Stefan Braun. And the real core paper for coconut credentials is called Coconut. And that gives you the decentralization and privacy. But if you're interested in the algebraic Mac work, which allows to have centralized privacy enhanced identity, which could be useful for some use cases like governments and places where you really need to really a lot of speed, a lot of transactions, you can look at my work on unlimited ID. And that's it. Um, I do want to, there was a lot of information at once. I just wanted, I'm just going to reiterate the fundamental points. And the fundamental points are this, that everyone's very concerned about currency, but identity is the real currency. And any plays for new global cryptocurrency schemes are effectively plays to make global identity systems. We already have the world's largest identity system operational right now, bigger than any nation state, ran by Facebook. But luckily, due to 20 years of research, we have the technology to build alternative. We even have working code. We just have more people be aware of the problem, build this into their own apps, and work with us to make more efficient, more private, and a more decentralized alternative. Because to be honest, I don't think anyone wants to live in a society where a single authority can watch all your transactions and have the control over both your financial transactions and the most intimate details of your life. We need to have privacy-enhanced decentralized alternatives, and I welcome you to just join us in helping make this true, make this a reality, fight back against Libra. So any questions? Thank you. That was emotional, but I think that's really, really worth it. We need engagement. We need to fight. Okay, do we have questions? No question. Da leuchtet ein weißes Licht. Ist das mein Signal, Engel? Hey. Hello. Ah. Uh, a question about the Libra. Uh, basically, when everybody puts money there, they pile up a lot of uh, cash. So it's kind of a, like a debit card. Uh, I couldn't find any information about what happens with the money while, after you give it to Facebook and before you spend it for something. Yeah, so, so, so this is something which there hasn't been too much work on in the public, because Facebook has published very little about this. That being said, it would likely work as a fractional reserve banking system. So that when you give control over sort of, you know, let's say you get a, I give Facebook $50, 50 euros, they can then, you know, have that under their control, or at least the Libra Association control, and then relend it out. So that it will effectively lead to mass capital accumulation uh, by the Liberal, Libra Association. If you add that by one third of humanity being stuck under Facebook Connect, that's a whole lot of cash, and that's essentially a parallel 
uh, corporate payment and banking infrastructure, which can rival traditional banking infrastructures. And that's on some level very cypherpunk, and on another level very terrifying. Okay, we have one more question. We just have one more question Sorry. now. Sorry, I'm Thank here you. afterwards. Yeah, here we'll be here afterwards. Uh, so, hi. Um, have you, any thoughts on uh, decentralized identity providers? So, would they verify um, governance credentials or anything? Or are there different ideas about that to do that decentralized? Yeah, so what we tried to do, if I can get back to the picture, is we tried to build a system where we disintermediate centralized providers from validation and verification. So, oh, there it is. So, you can see um, in this diagram in step two, okay. The, you, your identity provider could be the German government, which is a big centralized entity. They might sign off on just your age or just your passport, and you can make up some other stuff, and you can work these together and have them be validated in a decentralized way. So we don't think they're incompatible. Okay, thank you so much. You will be here for questions, and um, thank you for watching. Please wash your hands, take your stuff with you, and don't leave any garbage, and a big applause for Harry Hilbert.